My name is Stephen Ader. I was born in 1942. My parents were very dedicated Christians, Lutherans. During that time of, of uh, my growing up, all the kids, all of us had that fear of the possibility of a world war that would kill everybody. But so we sat in my room for maybe an hour and a half and we were saying, oh God, please send a messenger or a sign. There was a crash outside in the street in front of my house. And it was midnight on a very stormy night. And I thought, how can I tell this man, do you have a message for me? So I thought, if I tell him that, he's going to think I'm crazy. So instead of telling him that, I said, you know, I said, I believe that there, there's a destiny for every human being. And he said, well, the beginning of my belief was in 1844. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in 1844, there was a great, great person that came, a great teacher. And so I said, Pastor Bonker, is this true? And we looked at the hidden words. And he said, oh, well, this wouldn't be from Christ. So it's not really Christian. I said, but it's so beautiful and it's universal. I said, what about my friends who are from different countries and races and nations and language groups? He said, well, they're not going to be saved. I said, why aren't they saved? I said, but we need to have a universal religion for everybody. Why can't they be saved? And I decided that I want to learn more. So it's almost humorous what happened after that night when I first heard in the street in that man's car about this new cycle of human history. The, the Italian ships would go from New York to Italy and from Italy, I was going to go on the train to Austria, to Graz. So I remember I got on the ship in New York City after my bus trip, and I was put in the poorest part of the ship. I had three roommates. But these roommates, they were very difficult. They were drinking, and they were not happy, and they were noisy, and I, I was very disturbed. And I didn't want to be on the ship in that horrible cabin with those people. But then a lady came walking in, she had 14 trunks, big trunks. She came and she had a big room that she was gonna stay in, in that part of the ship. And I met her, I said, hi, how are you? She had a black cat. She was carrying a cat and a typewriter. And she said, oh, my name is Patricia Highsmith. I'm an author and I'm on my way to my home in Italy. And she said, who are you? And I said, I'm Stephen Ader and I come from Richmond, California and I'm going to Europe to study philosophy and art. Now Patricia Highsmith wrote murder stories and they were, she wrote the stories for Alfred Hitchcock who was a very famous director of, of uh, scary stories. And she was in the process of writing a story called The Talented Mr. Ripley which became later a very famous film. Well, whatever you do, however terrible, however hurtful, nobody thinks that they're a bad person. I said, you know, I don't know what to do. She said, what's the matter? I said, I'm in this room with these terrible people. These people, they're so noisy and they're drinking and they're mad and I don't want to be with them. She said, I think I can help you out. I said, how can you help me? She said, well, I speak Italian and so I can ask these people to give you another room. So in Italian, she spoke to the purser and she said, give this young man his own cabin. And guess what? They gave me an empty cabin. So I had my own cabin on the ship just for myself and I didn't have to pay extra money for it. So I was so happy. And I remember that I made friends with this Patricia Highsmith. So we became very good friends. And during the time on the ship, I thought, I think I wanna tell people about the hidden words. So I went and I made some invitations with my uh, pen and paper and I put invitations on people's door and I said, if you want to learn something beautiful, something about peace in the world, come to cabin 19 and we'll have a nice time together to read about the peace in the world. So guess what? A bunch of people came to my cabin 
and we read from the hidden words together in that cabin. It's so strange, isn't it, that I did that. But meanwhile, on the ship as we're traveling, a big storm came, a huge storm. The storm, the whole ship would go up like this and then go crash, and the water would go, the ocean water. It was amazing that this ship became like a toothpick. So we couldn't go to the dining room to eat our meals. We had to stay in our rooms. And I got very seasick during that time. It was really awful. And then finally, I got to Trieste and I had, it was midnight and I was all alone. I did, I've never been on a train in my life, believe it or not, even though I was a young man of 21 or 22 years old, I'd never been on a train really in my life. So I had to catch a train to go to Graz and I didn't know what to do. I was lost and I would ask people, what do I do, where do I go? And it started out that every time I would ask, somebody would help me. And I saw how nice people are, they're always helping you. I ended up in Graz and this man was a count. He was a famous uh, head of the medical school in Graz. And so staying in this big mansion and they had servants there, it was so amazing. And during those years, it was during the Cold War, called the Cold War. And so he had visiting scientists coming from behind the Iron Curtain. You understand what that means? It was that they called the, the, the world, the Eastern world was the Iron Curtain. You couldn't go there, it was secret. Communism was developing there, but they were trying to learn from the West. So they would send their brightest professors to learn from the universities in Europe and to, to learn. So these professors had come from the behind the Iron Curtain. And we were all sitting at this big dining room table. And the servants were bringing a food for us. And this Dr. Hans Bertha was his name, very famous. He was studying the brains of humans and dolphins. He was studying the brain. And I was so interested to learn from him all his studies about the brain and dolphins and the similarities between those things. But he was an atheist. And he said, well, tell me about this Baha'i thing. What is that? And so I would try to tell him, you know, oh, it's a uh, hidden words and this uh, a great teacher came. He said, oh, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I don't believe this. But then sometime at dinner, when we had all of those scientists there, he would say, Steve, tell all these people about your religion. So then I would say, okay, I don't know very much about it because I just heard about it in the street from a man, but I'll tell you what I know. So I would try to tell these people about this religion that I had found. Anyway, that was a very strange and interesting time to live in Austria, in Graz. I thought, what am I going to do? I can't stay here for months and months. I'm a, I'm a guest, you know. Sometimes the guest wears out their welcome. So I thought, I can't stay here. I know, I'll go to Munich. Because some of the friends said, you should go to Munich. You can study art in Munich. So guess what? I hitchhiked to Munich. And I, I got rides by hitchhiking. You know, you put your thumb out and car stops and you get in the car. And I had many fun, wonderful experiences hitchhiking from Graz to Vienna to Munich. And when I arrived in Munich, I went to the youth hostel. And there were a lot of youth traveling there. And I said, what am I going to do? I need to get a job. They said, you know, you can go to Siemens. It's a big electronics corporation. You can go to Siemens Halski and you can apply to be a foreign worker. I thought, okay, I'll do that. But I couldn't speak German. So I couldn't talk to anybody. I was trying to communicate, but most of the people, they didn't speak English. But I found my way somehow to apply for a job at Siemens as a worker, a foreign worker. So there I was working in this big electronics factory and I had a, 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 a company room. They gave you a place to live and they gave you a salary and then you had a simple job. And I made many friends at that time in this factory. One of my friends was um, uh, Hans Brandt. He was a famous philosopher and artist who was working in the factory, he said, because I want to be practical. I am an artist and I'm a poet and I'm a philosopher, but I want to work like a real human being. So he was working in that factory and he became a good friend of mine. 
and he became my teacher of art. So during that time, I learned how to paint. He told me, you know, you could live in the countryside with farmers. He said that would be better than living with those people in that little uh, room where you live. And then at that time, I heard from somewhere, I don't know where, that there was a big Baha'i conference in London. This was in 1964, maybe, or 63, 64. It was called the Most Great Jubilee. And that Baha'is had gone from all over the world. And I could feel, I said, I want to go there, but I'm working and I can't go there. And how am I going to ever meet the Baha'is? I never saw a Baha'i yet. This was now a year later. I never met any Baha'is, but I still was reading Hidden Words. And I also had people come to my place and we will read from Hidden Words and talk about peace and talk about unity of religion. So anyway, I moved to live in the countryside right next to the Black Forest. And I lived in this beautiful farmhouse on the upper floor of the farmhouse. I had a bedroom, a little kitchen, and a bathroom, and I paid a very low rent, and I had to build my own fire every day in the stove, and I had to cook my laundry. You know, in Germany, you boil your laundry to clean your, instead they don't have a washing machine in a more primitive life, so I had to take my laundry, put it in a big kettle, and boil it to clean, and then you rinse the, the laundry. So I did my own laundry, I learned how to cook, I had to do all these things myself. But I lived in that German village, and then suddenly I realized I don't know the Baha'is. So I wrote a letter, because I had the address of Baha'is in the United States. And I said, Dear Baha'is, I'm living in a little German village, and I want to have more information about Baha'i. How can I meet the Baha'is? And then about a few weeks later, because we didn't have computers and email, it was always a letter, you had to wait for several weeks for a letter to come back. I got a letter that it was a postcard, and the postcard was from Haifa. And the letter said, Dear Mr. Ader, I am the secretary of the National Assembly of the Baha'is. In other words, the National Administrative Group. And I received your information, and when I returned from my pilgrimage, she was in Haifa on a pilgrimage, she said, I will contact you and give you the the address of the Baha'is in Munich. So I was so happy. And then she said, and by the way, I'm saying prayers for you. And I thought, why is she praying for me? What did I do wrong? It was a very strange, to my mind, it was very strange that she said, I'm praying for you. I didn't understand that. Her name was Annalisa Bopp, B-O-P-P. -P. She came back from the pilgrimage. I got a letter from her and it said, now you may meet the Baha'is at this address. I was so excited. I remember it was payday. On that day I met the Baha'is, I got my paycheck, and I thought, I think the number of Baha'is is nine, because I heard that the temples that Baha'is build have nine sides. And I heard that nine was an important number. So I said, I will buy nine roses and I'll take the nine roses to this Baha'i person I'm going to meet for the first time and give them the nine roses. So I bought nine red roses and I went to the house that late afternoon and it was a big, beautiful house. And I knocked on the door, the door opened and a lady said, welcome, welcome. Are you Steve? I said, yeah, here are some roses for you. She said, come in, come in, we're so happy to meet you. And I went into the house and she began to tell me that her name was Gina Garcia and her husband Russell Garcia. Russell Garcia was a great composer and he wrote music for American television. He was very, very well known. And they were living in Europe making a film, a movie at the time, and he was writing the music for the film. The amazing Russ Garcia. sitting in their living room. 
listening to the story about Baha'u'llah again from Gina Garcia. And she was telling me all these beautiful things and I was asking questions. And she said, well, aren't you a Baha'i? I said, no, I don't know what that means. What do I do? She said, well, you sign a card and then you're part of Baha'i community and they, they will can contact you and be in touch with you. So then she said, now you're going to meet the local assembly of Munich. That's the nine people that are elected to be on the local uh, group that helps the Baha'is in their local community. And I was very nervous. I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to meet these people. I don't know how, what I'm supposed to say. So I met them and they welcomed me and said, now you're part of Baha'i community. And I was so happy. a letter to my parents and I said mom and dad I have become a Baha'i I have learned about this and they didn't know what it was but they were very interested eventually some years later in fact ten years later my mother became a Baha'i as well and my father too and my brother so our whole family became Baha'i a Baha'i family which I didn't expect and I didn't try to convince them but it was my mother who said she was reading the prayers and she said, these are beautiful, beautiful prayers. I feel I get more spiritual food from these prayers than from anything else. And so she decided she wanted to also be part of Baha'i, a Baha'i faith. I had decided that I wanted to go to India to see people in India, to learn about India, and also to tell people about Baha'i. I had to take a bus from Munich to Istanbul to Tehran. And when I arrived in Tehran, I stayed with some friends there, a Samandari family. I made friends amongst the people in Iran. It was so precious. I love Persian food. So I learned to have this great love of gourmet sabzi was my favorite dish. And my poor host would ask me, what would you like for dinner tonight? And I'd say, I want that green stuff, the gourmet sabzi, it's so delicious. And so I remember she was chopping and chopping in the kitchen, so many hours working on it. And then the next day they say, what would you like for lunch? And I say, gourmet sabzi, the same thing, it's my favorite dish. And then she would have to work so hard. And I thought, I didn't realize I was such a difficult guest. My poor host, they were so nice to me and they made gourmet sabzi for me a lot. <laughs> it was so delicious. Our past doesn't matter. If our hearts are searching, then the answer will come like a breeze. Thank you.